and I'm with the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Thank you so much for joining us today for Orphaned and Injured Wildlife, What to Know and What to Do. Very important and very timely topic, as I'm sure you can agree. I will be talking to you for about the next 45 minutes about some things that, some advice and some things to keep in mind if you in fact encounter an orphaned or injured animal, or at least then you can have some information you can share with others. And, and that's the key, right, is to spread the good message of how to intervene if in fact humans do need to intervene, especially this time of year. So I have a PowerPoint I'll share in just a moment. I want to um, first thank my esteemed colleague, Logan Oates, for helping out today. He's recording this presentation. So if you know someone who was unable to make it, it will be recorded and shared on YouTube and hopefully later this week, if not sooner. So just keep an eye out for that. And um, if you have to step away unexpectedly, you'll be able to catch up with it later. Logan will be monitoring the chat box since I won't have access to it during the presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and put them into the chat box and we will be more than happy to answer your questions either as we move along <clears throat> or we'll save time at the end to answer questions then too. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. All right, how's that look, Logan? Looks wonderful. Full screen. Thank you. So I have been in many situations over the 18 years that I've been employed by the Ohio Division of Wildlife where wildlife may or may not need help but I've been I've connected with someone who has questions and wants advice and guidance on how to handle the situation. And so we're just, we're gonna break it down and talk about um, some various things involving this very important topic. But before we get to that, you may already be familiar with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, but if not, you're probably wondering exactly how does this organi organization work and where does Division of Wildlife fit in? So you can picture ODNR like an umbrella, it's a big agency that is responsible for protecting our natural resources in the state of Ohio. So on your screen, you'll see all the divisions that make up ODNR. And each division has our own tasks for exactly what we are intended to do. And I can give you a guess. I can give you three guesses, but I'm sure you only need one for what Division of Wildlife's mission is. So of course, we're guided, we're in, and we're required to protect our native species in the state of Ohio. And we want to protect them for everyone to enjoy, whether it's through hunting or fishing or wildlife watching, whatever the case may be, maybe all of the above for you, we are protecting our wildlife populations to enjoy now and for future generations. You may be familiar with the other sister agencies of ours, perhaps the Parks and Watercraft Division or oil and gas, maybe natural areas and preserves. And we're all very important for the tasks that we are required to complete. And Division of, of um, Natural Areas and Preserves, for instance, believes very strongly in preservation. And that simply means to set a property aside, perhaps because it's fragile. There's many rare plants and rare animals that may live on these properties, and they're tasked with protecting those properties. <clears throat> Where Division of Wildlife, we believe strongly in conservation. So it's similar, except for the fact that we, we, we encourage Ohioans to use our resources, our wildlife resources in this particular case, wisely. We want to enjoy seeing wildlife. We want to protect the habitats where you can find wildlife, but we want to do so in a very meaningful and very responsible way. So we're able to hike and hunt and fish on the public properties where you can find this 
this wildlife, but we do so in a responsible manner. So I hope that makes sense, just to give you a little bit of background about ODNR and Division of Wildlife. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on that because time is of the essence. So we're just gonna jump right into the topic at hand today and talk about orphaned and injured animals, why it's important to know some background information, especially you're all here today because you care about animals and you care about wildlife. And I can identify with that, I do too. So I wanna do the best I can for wildlife. When I see a problem or what I perceive to be a problem, I want to do my very best to, to help that animal in the best way possible. So we're going to break down some common encounters and talk about how we handle those common encounters. And if you must intervene, what the best way is to do that. So basically, there is a common misconception that all young animals are automatically orphaned or abandoned. If someone stumbles upon a nest of rabbits, for instance, or a nest of songbirds, and there's no adult present, something must be wrong. And that is not true most of the time. Wild animal adults, mothers, for instance, females are required to still feed. They have to still sustain themselves. They can't do that in care for the young both especially if there's not a male in the, the scene that helps out. In some cases, some species, both the male and female adults are present and help care for the young, but in a lot of cases, they're not. So if it's a female, uh, a wild, a, a fox species, for instance, she may have to leave and there may not be a male around and she's required to care for these animals all by herself. So there, there's, it's very case by case, species by species, but in general, oftentimes if an adult isn't present, that's because they're out trying to forage either for themselves or for their young. I don't wanna to spend too much time on that, but that's often the case. It's hard to accept sometimes, but the basic principle is that the animals reproduce in some species more than others at rapid rates at, with abundance because not everything survives and it's not meant to. And it, again, it depends on the species. Some species are more prolific, they reproduce more rapidly or in greater numbers in a short period of time than others, but it's just, that's nature's principle. That just not everything is meant to survive for a long time. And we just have to learn to accept that in some respects. But there's often situations where we can intervene if we must and help that animal. But there are ways to do it responsibly that's best for the animal and best for humans too. And so we're gonna break that down. The very first question, if you see an, a scene, you encounter a scene, you see a problem and you, what, why do you think there's a problem? Think just, take a step back in your mind and think to yourself, why do I perceive there to be a problem? What about this situation is unsettling to me? So some things to consider when you see a wild animal that you think is in distress, that you think needs help, ask yourself, do I see blood? Do I see a broken wing or a broken leg? Is the animal favoring a body part? Is it limping? Is it having trouble flying? If you're close enough and it's safe enough, if you can see the animal's face, perhaps a, an owl that is on the ground, is there something about its eyes that just don't look quite right? Is it sitting funny or flying funny? And if you have any experience with wildlife or even domestic animals, you probably can notice some of these things, but not everything, but seeing blood or a broken wing, it usually is pretty obvious, depending on the seriousness of the matter, of course. And most wild animals are not going to allow humans to approach it very closely, right? They're either gonna show signs of, of stress by vocalizing or trying to run or fly away, especially if they're not cornered. And then they may just not react at all. And when they don't react at all, that's definitely a sign that something is amiss. So all these things will definitely lead one to understand that the animal may be in need of help. So if in fact there's something amiss that fits that last slide, then assess from a distance the scene. Make sure that it's safe for you as a human to approach and it's safe for the animal. 
see what's going on before you jump right in. If you've ever received any kind of first aid training to help humans, this is the one of the very first steps is to make sure that the scene is safe, that there's no traffic that's going to impede you being able to help, for instance. You want to think about your safety as much as you want to think about the well-being of the animal that you want to help. Absolutely, after you assess the scene and you get a picture of what's happening, of the situation, why you think the animal needs help, and what's going on in that little world around that animal, and what you're watching going on, then call a professional. And I will connect you at the end of this presentation with information on how to reach a professional, whether it's Division of Wildlife, one of our many terrific wildlife rehabilitators in the state of Ohio, or another professional who can help guide you before you actually intervene, because advice can go a very, very long way. And many of us who have been doing this a long time have seen almost all of it, probably not all of it, because I feel like in my 18 years, new situations and new cases that I've never experienced pop up, but we can give you really, really good advice based on our experience and what we think is best for everyone involved. So don't touch the animal, don't make injuries worse. You wanna make sure that you're doing everything the best way possible. If you have to move that animal for any reason, and we'll break down what that might entail, make sure to protect your skin and your eyes because what do wild animals do, especially when they're in distress? Much of the time, they're gonna try to protect themselves. They feel more vulnerable than ever. So they might bite and scratch. We don't want humans hurt when they're trying to help, when we're trying to help wildlife. It's really hard. I know this from personal experience, not to want to feed and to provide water to an animal in need and in distress, especially if I have intuition is telling me that the animal has had been able to feed for a long time. It looks skinny. I have a sense that it's dehydrated. I want to make it feel better, but we oftentimes don't know what is going on with the animal, especially in the few first few minutes. And especially if we're, if we're not familiar, if you're not a wildlife professional, it's going to be really hard to understand exactly what's wrong with that animal. And so feeding and watering that animal might make things worse. So refrain from giving it any food or water and then keep it dark. If you're able to, if you do have to remove that animal from the scene because you're, it's unsafe for that animal or unsafe for pets and, and adults and, and kids, then put it in a dark place, maybe a, a cardboard box. If it's a small animal, a cardboard box with a lid um, so that it's nice and quiet and put it away somewhere where it can just be calm. And that will help that animal from being even more stressed out. All these pictures on these slides are real life scenarios that either I've experienced personally or that my colleagues have experienced. And this picture on the slide, it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at, but I took this picture looking down on a Carolina wren nest and it's in, it's safely inside a cardboard box at this point. And we didn't know when we drove away with a trailer an hour and a half from our office in Akron a few years ago, that a Carolina wren pair had built a nest in a spare tire of our trailer. And we get to our event only to have a little kid tell us that there is a nest of baby birds crying from the tire. And we were completely shocked, but we acted accordingly and we safely removed the nest from the tire. We put it in a cardboard box. We returned to Akron put the nest in a nearby tree and where it was protected. And the Carolina wren pair came back and started nest tending to their babies immediately. And to make everything as best as we could, we found in, uh, they like to be in cavities. And this is why they like to be inside that spare tire. So we were able to then find a, uh, an old rain barrel and we were able to turn it on its side and create this nice little place where it would be as safe as possible from predators and to replicate something as close as we could find to that spare tire that was no longer available. So we were able to reunite these baby birds with the parents, which is absolutely ideal. I absolutely ideal. So 
to that end, if you find a baby bird that is on the ground, it has no feathers, it may have been bumped out of the nest. Maybe it was a strong breeze or a strong gust of wind that knocked that baby bird to the ground. And they are pretty resilient little creatures. So if you don't see any blood, you don't see any wounds of any kind, it's okay to try to put that, that baby bird back in the nest. It's a, an old wives tale that, that birds have, a, that songbirds have a sense of smell and that you'll scare the parents off. This is untrue, but it's it's good to put on gloves anyway. You don't want the oils from your hands to, to have any ill effects on the little bird's skin. So put on a pair of gloves, put it back in the tree. If you can't, try to replicate that nest. If the nest has fallen apart because of weather, replicate that nest. Gather up all the natural materials that you can and get a little basket or a pail with a, a hole drilled in the bottom so rainfall can drain out and put that that basket as far up in the tree as you can and allow those parents to reunite. This is the, gonna be what you hear throughout the program is to do your best to reunite these babies with their, their parents or with their mother because nobody, no one can take as good a care of these young wildlife as their parents can. If you find a bird nest in a chimney and it, and you and it's not an ideal situation to, especially if it's an unactive chimney, if you can just let it stay there until they fledge only for a few weeks, that would be ideal. But if you can't, move it to a safe place outside where parents can find it. When the babies are vocalizing, they will alarm the parents that they where they are. So try your best to let everything remain as natural as possible. Take the nesting material, put it outside somewhere safe, away from, from pets, for instance, and allow the parents to find them that way. The really tough part about birds in the late spring is when these birds are fledging. And that means that they do have most of their adult feathers. They're starting to get itchy to leave the nest. They're getting a little bit more courageous. So they're stepping out on the edge of the nest and then finally, they get up the courage to fly out of the nest, but they're not strong enough. Their muscles haven't developed quite yet, and they flutter to the ground. And these, this probably is the most common call I get about baby birds is this fully feathered little bird sitting on the ground, yapping and calling for, for its mother. And it's just not strong enough to get back into that nest. And if you do scoop it up with a gloved hand and put it back in the nest, if you're able to do that, chances are 20 minutes later, it's going to be back on the ground again, because that's part of its growing experience. It's trying to develop those muscles so that it is stronger in flight. And the only way it can do that is to continue practicing. So you can scoop it up. If you can't reach the nest, you can scoop it up and put it in a little shrub or something a little bit off the ground to try and help it. But in the end, the best thing to do is to give it its distance. Mom and dad will continue to feed these baby birds even when they're grounded. They will make sure to take care of them. Parents, wildlife parents are so devoted. They want to see their young survive and grow to adulthood. So we just sometimes have to let them do that. So as long as there's no pets that are going to, to uh, be a concern for these young birds, just let them have their space. Maybe keep pets inside during that time or keep them in a place that is safe from wildlife. Window strikes, I'm gonna wrap up the slide about songbirds and talk about window strikes. This is really a common problem for injured birds. Plus it's often fatal and that can easily be avoided by breaking up the reflection on picture windows, for instance, or full glass storm doors on the front of our houses. Birds can't, can't differentiate between landscape, natural landscape and glass, especially very clean and very reflective glass. So there's all kinds of options for breaking up that reflection from pretty stickers and adhesive adhesives to mylar tape to paracord, which is what I use. It's called a copian system. And we can share more information at the end, but anything you can do to break up reflection, even if it's just during the spring and summer months when birds are the most active. But if you have a bird feeder, you can reduce window strikes by breaking up that reflection in the winter too, if you feed during the winter time. So that's gonna help, help wildlife, birds specifically tremendously by helping break up any reflections of glass on your home or at, at your office. 
Any questions about Songbirds, Logan, before we move along? Nothing in the chat, Jamie. Thank you. Raptors are much larger than songbirds. These are birds of prey or birds that prey on other birds, other smaller birds or snakes or rodents, rabbits. And this includes hawks and owls and falcons. And similarly to songbirds, they will oftentimes, these youngsters will start branching out, which means that they will leave the nest and crawl around on the limbs around them, trying to strengthen not just their courage, but also their muscles. And sometimes they too will flutter to the ground and then it's tough for them to get back in the tree. Not impossible, depending on the species. Owls are very good climbers. They're similar to parrots in the fact that they can use their beaks to grab onto bark and branches. So if it's a tree that has lower limbs, they may be able to get themselves back up into the tree, probably not all the way back up to the nest, but at least off the ground where things are a little bit safer, but not all species can do that. So some of them will just end up staying on the ground and, and parents will still bring them food. But again, just like songbirds, if you hang around too close because you're worried about the bird and the adults see you, they're not going to put themselves in harm way much of the time in order to try to save their young. So they are going to watch from a distance until the human, the presence of humans is gone and then they will approach their babies. So watch through a window, watch from a distance, keep an eye on them and hopefully the parents will return. So you're probably wondering, but what if the parents don't return? And I will get to that later on in, in the presentation. We will definitely cover that. But so much of the time, with just a little bit of advice and guidance, everything will turn out okay. We just have to give animals, wild animals, the opportunity to do what they are meant to do, and that's to survive. That's what they do best, is to survive and to reproduce. And same with the, the songbirds, if, if you find a nest, a raptor nest that has fallen out of a tree because of a, a terrible windstorm, for instance, just try your best to recreate that nest and elevate it. Maybe it's a piece of plywood that is nailed back into the tree to create a platform so you can put the nesting material back on in it. Maybe it's a bucket, again, with a hole drilled in the bottom so rainfall can drain. Anything you can do to try and recreate that nest so that you can put really little babies or eggs back into it. If it's older birds that just aren't strong enough to fly yet, again, if you put that bird that's fully feathered, just not strong enough to fly back in the nest, it's probably going to bounce back out again or flutter back out again. So in that case, just try to keep your distance. And window strikes do happen with birds of prey, with raptors too. It's not quite as common it, as songbirds, but it can happen. We get calls about owls and cooper's hawks. So breaking up that reflection will help these birds as well. Moving on to ducks and geese. So we do get a lot of calls about Canada geese and they will nest in places that may not seem like the, the wisest choice to us. But sometimes we just have to think about what's going on in their heads. And in a high traffic area, maybe for high traffic, meaning lots of cars, lots of bicycles, lots of people on foot walking on a trail, for instance, to geese, this may be a form of protection, although they don't particularly like being approached or passed by humans all the time, those humans passing by all the time may keep coyotes and raccoons and other predators at bay. So it's not uncommon anymore for us to hear about nests that are in places that don't seem like the most ideal spot, but it feels safer for geese. And they're very adaptable, proven by the fact that Canada geese are virtually in every inch of landscape in the state of Ohio. They are just remarkable creatures for their ability to, to tolerate humans and to adapt to the environment that we have provided to them. So they can be a little protective and our professionals at Division of Wildlife or Wildlife Rehabilitator can give you excellent guidance on how best to deal with a nest that's maybe in the way, not in the best place. Sometimes that's just simply putting up a piece of snow fencing so that there's a barrier between the goose nest and the doorway, doorway where people are constantly flowing in and out. Just that piece of snow fence for a few weeks will make the geese feel safer. It prevents them from feeling like they have to approach humans to protect their nest. 
And if, if someone can tolerate that snow fence for just a few weeks, then all is well. So there's lots of options out there though. And it's just a matter of finding what option works best for the situation. If you see a goose with, or a duck with injured feet or legs, please contact a professional for guidance because this is a case by case situation. I have learned that, that they become very, very smart, very wary when they feel injured, animal, wild animals in general, but it's especially tough with geese and ducks because they will stay by water. And unless they are fully incapable of flight or of moving, they will quickly dash into the water and swim off or float and flutter into the water and swim off before we can even blink. So it's a very, very tough situation, but not impossible to help an animal that is in distress. But in this picture that I have on the slide right now, this is of a fishing lure. Somehow the goose had gotten it stuck in its feathers on its back. This is not a situation where we would intervene because in chances are we would do more harm than good. We would stress this goose out. We can't catch it because it's fully capable of flight. It's not injured. And when it's shedding its feathers, when it's molting, it will probably, the lure will fall off and we're going to let that happen. So we don't want to put that goose through more stress than necessary. A lone gosling or duckling that does happen and chances are a professional can try to reunite the duckling with, or gosling, sorry, with um, another family of geese that's been known to happen. So that is a possibility. So this is a perfect example of when to contact a professional for advice and what can, it, what can be done. Ducklings and sewers, as many of us know, this is a common problem every year that can be alleviated by calling a professional, maybe a local law enforcement agency, local uh, fire, uh, contact the local firefighters or our wildlife officers. And it's just a matter of pulling those ducks back out of those sewers and reuniting them with mom who is always close by because they have just fallen into the sewer by mistake as they're moving from point A to point B. The last note on this slide um, is about angel wing. And if you're not familiar with angel wing, this is when a, a goose's or duck's wing will turn basically inside out. At least that's how it looks. It causes, um, it's caused by malnutrition. So the bones don't develop quite right when the bird is young and growing. And that's from being fed bread or popcorn or other food products that have no sustenance, no nutrition. These poor birds fill themselves full of stuff that doesn't have any value. And then they don't eat what they're supposed to be eating in the natural environment that will help them grow strong and healthy. And then it, their bones don't develop right. So the wing is not broken. I, I see it often where the wing just, it looks funny. It's growing funny. So please encourage folks to discontinue feeding our waterfowl. Or if they must feed waterfowl that we've all, I'm sure, can talk about a time growing up in our childhood where we took a loaf of bread to the local park and was tossing out chunks of bread. We, we, it's nice to reminisce about all these good experiences we had in nature and that has brought us to where we are today, perhaps. But in that case, if you still want to experience that with your friends and family, choose an alternative source that actually has nutrition like corn or pellets that you can purchase from local um, supply stores that, that specialize in agriculture. They have food that's specifically designed to feed ducks and geese that have nutrition. So a little bit of that doesn't hurt nearly as much as feeding bread and popcorn and that, that stuff that doesn't have any nutrition. So we talked a little bit about birds of prey. Um, some more things to think about is that is um, we might see raptors next to the roadside. Often these are red-tailed hawks. This is the, the roadside hawk, otherwise known. And these are really common hawks, but we may see other species too, because road alongside roadways are often short grasses where there's an abundance of rodents. And it's one of um, the favorite prey of, of many birds of prey. So if you see a bird that has its wings 
kind of circled over and it looks like it's hiding, it's called mantling. And this is a bird that is feeding. It's protecting its food source from probably other birds and it just wants to hide it so that it has it to itself. This is not a bird that's injured. This is just a bird that's naturally behaving and they don't stay like that for very long. And once they land on their prey, they'll mantle it, perhaps make sure that it's safe and then fly off. So that's not a bird that needs help. We just need to just leave it alone so that it can do its thing. A fledgling, we talked about fledgling on the ground. Hawks that um, might be at the base of a tree that are acting disoriented or maybe unconscious. This happens often with buildings and power lines. This is an animal that does need help. It has clearly experienced some sort of trauma in a professional. It needs to be taken to a professional. So absolutely right away, con contact a professional. And again, we'll talk about that at the end. If the bird seems like it can't fly off, it's trying to, to lift off the ground and it just can't do it. Maybe it's exhausted, but maybe it's injured. And in this case, it probably needs help. So right away, when you look at the scene and you realize this bird can't go, get away from you, it's not vocalizing perhaps, or maybe it's vocalizing and trying to get away, but it just can't get lifted off the ground. It definitely needs to have a professional look at it. And in this case, um, this picture on the slide here, this is of a peregrine falcon, that if you look at the wings and compare the two wings side by side, do you notice that its right wing is really droopy? That And if you look really closely, you may also be able to see that there's a, a little bit of pink, pink tone to it, and, and that's blood. So you can see that the wing is drooping down, the bird is looking sideways. At this point, my colleague approached and it didn't try to fly away. It was probably too exhausted and in too much pain to do so, even if it wanted to try. And in this case, the, the bird was safely collected and taken to a professional wildlife rehabilitator. So moving on from birds, we spent a long time on birds because they are so commonly encountered, but another common encounter includes our wild canids or wild canines, coyotes and foxes. These are very intelligent animals, very inquisitive, and oftentimes they are not habituated, meaning that they're, they haven't lost their fear of humans, but they're just really curious. So if, if a fox or a coyote is standing out in a field, and this is a, a true example, um, and actually quite common example, and watching you mow the lawn. Maybe you're on a riding lawnmower, or you're pushing your lawnmower, and it's just standing there watching at a distance. This is an animal that's just curious. It's kind of watching the world go by, and perhaps wondering if you're gonna stir up some delicious prey items. Maybe some, you might scare out some rodents or some snakes while that ground is vibrating. And if that's the case, they're gonna to try to snatch up that opportunity. That's not a problem, but it's a good idea to clap your hand, shout at it and scare that animal away. Even though this is not a problem yet, oftentimes wildlife conflicts arise because it's, a, it's over time it's growing, the problem is being created and we just don't realize it. If that animal then starts to come closer over time and becoming reliant on an opportunity, maybe it's not mowing the lawn, but it's leaving garbage or pet food out overnight, or they, they start to associate a barbecue grill with delicious snacks and tasty treats, then they start to become a little bit less fearful of humans. So we want to just nip it in the bud and keep those inquisitive animals like coyote and foxes fearful of human presence. So again, clap your hands, wave your hands over your head, make a lot of noise, and they will run away. Ideally, they don't want to become used to human presence. That's not natural for a wildlife to become fearless of humans. But like I mentioned about Canada geese, sometimes they will embrace an opportunity and, and find a way to tolerate us for the greater good of their, their family members, for instance. What I mean by that is that they may be willing to den underneath a shed or a porch and raise their young because they are now perceiving humans to be less threatening to the other predators on the landscape that they have to contend with. So some people are gonna be excited and embrace the opportunity to allow these, these 
this family of foxes or coyotes to be raised on their property, but some people won't. So again, if you are one of the people who just, it's not going to work work out to allow these foxes or coyotes to raise young on your property because you have kids or you have pets or you just don't like it. You have to keep that animal away. You have to scare it away. So in the early spring, they're setting up shop. They're looking for den sites. So if you see an animal hanging around more and more, that's probably what it's doing is scouting out a place to raise its young. So remove any access points, fill in holes under sheds, put chicken wire on around areas of access where you think might be a, a cavity that where they might want to create a den site for their young prevention is is worth a lot so just keeping on it and keeping these animals wild will allow them to find a more suitable place elsewhere when we do have an animal hanging around and um, human presence and they're acting fearless then maybe it could be mange. This is one of, of many possibilities, but again, it, a coyote or fox that shows no fear of humans, there's, there's a red flag there. And mange is very, very common. So an animal that's feeling fatigued and ill will show signs of, of a drooped head, of, of eyes that don't look healthy, it looks disoriented, it might be walking in circles, it may be panting aggressively. And mange is, is pretty nasty. It's a, a mite that burrows into the skin and causes the hair to fall out. As you can see in this picture of this coyote that has very little fur left, once the fur falls out, the mite will fall off and then the fur will eventually grow back. So if this happens in the late spring, early summer, the animal can recover. It won't succumb to the elements. But if this happens in the fall or winter, then that's not good. It's going to be really hard on the animal and probably fatal. So it's best to contact a wildlife professional, local law enforcement or a wildlife officer. And that animal then will be removed from the landscape for its own well-being, especially to put it out of its misery. We do get calls every now and then about an animal like you see in the left-hand picture. This, as you might, you might not recognize it. That's because it's not a wild red fox or a wild gray fox, the two fox species we have in Ohio. This is a, a, a mix domesticated uh, breed. So people do raise animals in captivity that might be a species that we find native in Ohio or looks similar, you can't remove an animal. It's unlawful to take an animal out of the wild and keep it as a pet. However, if it's propagated in captivity with the proper permits, it's reproducing in captivity, those young can be obtained with the proper permits by individuals. So there are folks out there who have different species as pets, including these foxes, and sometimes they get loose. Again, they're very intelligent animals, and this was a situation in an Akron where we got a call from a woman who said that she had a fox on her porch scratching at the door wanting in, and it was it probably wanted fed. And it just saw humans as um, no different than the human who raised it. So we ultimately were able to reunite this fox with its rightful owner and get it back home where it belonged. Cottontail rabbits. So there are anything cuter than baby bunnies? I don't know. They are pretty adorable. So it's exciting to find a nest in some respects in our lawns or in our flower beds, but it can be a tough situation, especially if you have pets. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can handle a situation like this one. And this is a picture I took in my own yard and I always do transects before I mow in the spring and summer months to make sure that I don't have nests, I don't have snakes in my yard, I don't wanna hurt anything with my mowing practices. So I scout out my lawn before I mow. However, I still mowed over this nest and thankfully there was no tragic story because the depression was deep enough that the mower went right over. But as I pressed along, I felt a depression with my foot. That's how I discovered this nest. And a, a mother rabbit had dug out a spot in the grass and she produced her young and covered it up with her own fur and then dead grass on top and i just simply didn't notice it so it can be tricky but i was able to fix this situation 
by flagging the area. It didn't bother me that they were there. I was able to keep my dogs away, but I would put a stake in the ground so I'd remember it was there so I could mow around it and allow her to come back and, and continue caring for her young. Even though I've been doing this a long time, I still don't hesitate to call colleagues and, and ask for advice to make sure that I'm making the right calls just to ensure that I'm doing the right thing. So I immediately reached out to colleagues and said, this is the situation presented to me. How, what should I do? Should I do A, B, and C? And we all agreed. And just to make sure, to make me feel better too, I did a, a common practice, which is to put a tic-tac-toe pattern of sticks. You can see that in the right-hand photo over the nest. And in that way, I could tell later on if mom came back to care for her young. Certainly mom wasn't going to come back while I was there, but at dusk and dawn, especially, and sometimes, sometimes throughout the night when, when the female feels safer, she'll come back and tend to her young. So the first night I put these sticks on the nest as, as I've so many times read about and, and told others about. And the next morning I checked the sticks and they looked absolutely the same. There was no indication that there was any um, movement to the sticks. And so I got a little nervous. And so I, I thought I should just leave them alone, but I, I checked and the babies were still there. Everything looked healthy. So I tucked them back in and left. So I went back at, at um, dusk from a distance, looked at the sticks and they still looked the same. So I went on YouTube and watched a video of a cottontail female tending to her young. And what they do is that they barely barely peel that grass, that dead grass on top. They peel it back ever so slightly. The young just ever so slightly poke their little noses out and feed from her belly. And then they tuck right back in. They don't expose any of their bodies except their little faces and they, they barely move. So when I was looking for these sticks to just be completely moved out of the way, I hadn't made the sticks intricate enough if that makes sense. So I was able to put more sticks on top of the nest. I didn't bother the babies. I just walked up and laid some more sticks closer together. And the next morning they were moved. So, and I put them across the whole opening. So that made me feel better just to know that mom was still around. Another situation that's commonly encountered is when that nest is not discovered by the human, but instead by a cat that roams outdoors or by a dog that's roaming the yard. My dogs are fenced in, but they still have freedom to, ro to roam within that fenced in area. And we've had rabbits attempt to nest inside that fenced in area. And the dogs are out there all the time. So it's not like the dogs aren't very often present. And yet that those rabbits still wanted to, to build their nests inside this fenced in area. If a nest is raided by a domestic pet, the babies absolutely need to be taken to a rehabilitator. They're very fragile animals. Even a dog that just picks up a baby bunny and carries it to you and drops it at your feet and is very gentle with it, maybe just alert alerting you of, of this nest. They don't, the dog doesn't mean any harm. Still, their mouths might have injured that baby. So just seek a professional in that case. If you see a small rabbit alone in the yard, just leave it alone, give it its distance, keep pets away and, uh, and remind children to be respectful and not handle it because it's probably just exploring its surroundings. It's big enough now that has left the nest and it's, it's gaining muscle strength and courage to start learning this wild world that we all live in. So just give it its distance as best you can. Squirrels, lots of squirrels on our landscape, especially in urban and suburban areas. This is a picture of a flying squirrel nest, which isn't as commonly encountered, but flying squirrels are relatively common, especially in the forested parts of our state. So they can be encountered too, but most of the time it's red fox or fox squirrels, sorry, and gray squirrels. And sometimes they do tumble out of the nest during weather events, just like songbirds or raptors. And that's going to be a tough one to try to reunite that baby squirrel with the, the nest, because usually squirrel nests are so far up in the tree. So the best thing to do is give it distance because mom can come back and retrieve that baby. She's strong enough 
to grab the, the nape of the neck, the back of the baby's neck and carry it back up into the tree. Squirrels are amazing and very strong creatures. So unlike songbirds, these squirrel moms can absolutely take their babies back and place them that in the nest, but they're not gonna do it if you're hovering nearby or, or if a pet um, or a youngster is, is hovering nearby. So just give it its space. If you feel like it's not safe because of outdoor cats roaming around, perhaps an upside down laundry basket with a brick on top, is all you need to do in order to keep cats out. If there's holes big enough for uh, to allow the the mother squirrel to enter and retrieve her young, but it keeps the cats out, then then you're helping that baby squirrel survive until mom can return. There's other steps that can be taken too to help this baby squirrel, especially if it's chilly outside and being exposed to the elements. It's not fully furred yet. There's some steps that you can take to help keep this animal safe while you're waiting for mom to return, like just a warm water bottle inside a, a shallow cardboard box will keep it from succumbing to the elements and allowing mom to, to then return. But seek advice from a professional in that case, just to make sure that they're doing everything right. A baby squirrel dropped on its doorstep is probably a gift from a local outdoor cat, maybe your own. So this happens a lot. Outdoor domestic cats are really hard on wildlife. And sometimes they kill their prey. Sometimes they just maim their prey and then deliver it as a gift to the homeowner. So in that case, it does, this animal does need medical attention from a professional wildlife rehabilitator. If a nest is found in an attic where a, the adult has may, managed to, to sneak in through a little crack or crevice, it's amazing what squirrels can fit into. If they can get their little heads through, they can get their whole bodies through. This applies to all sorts of rodents, not just squirrels, mice and and other creatures too. So if, uh, if it's a, a tiny little crack, just don't be surprised if wildlife can fit through there. So it goes back to prevention for future reference. If, if you've had problems with wildlife, you've got to fix cracks and crevices in your home where you're going to have more squirrels. But in the case of having to deal with the situation at hand, if there's a squirrel nest in an attic, perhaps collecting the babies and placing them outside where the adult can retrieve them and then fixing that crevice so that they can't get back inside might be the best course of action. But again, contact a professional for proper guidance. Moving on to raccoons, very, very commonly encountered species too. And these are abundant critters on the landscape that can live here, there, and everywhere. Similar to Canada geese, they're adaptable and quite tolerant of humans and very intelligent and can make the most of almost any situation presented to them. And they're very curious creatures. That intelligence leads them to, to wanting to explore their surroundings at a very young age. So it's not uncommon to see a group of very young raccoons out wandering around in the daytime. They've gotten anxious, maybe mom is off feeding and they are starting to explore and just get further and further from the den site. They're very vocal creatures. So they may be vocalizing and making lots of noise, but it's not because of stress. It's just because that's what they're doing or maybe they are calling for mom. They want mom to come back and they're getting hungry. And so they're trying to find mom. So the most important thing in that case is to give them space. That way mom can come back and corral them back into a safer place, keep pets at bay. I have a very, very spirited Jack Russell Corgi mix and I have to be ever vigilant this time of year. She's always leashed or cabled when she's outside. And still though, these young creatures that are out wandering around and exploring their environments can wander into our yard. So I have to be extra, extra, extra vigilant to make sure that one doesn't accidentally wander into the yard when my dog is outside. And this is especially likely to happen at dusk and dawn when a lot of these creatures are most active anyway, but it can happen throughout the daytime hours too. If you do find young, that it's, they're very clearly orphaned. That means that you find a, a dead adult female nearby, perhaps she got struck by a car. And in this case, a wildlife professional absolutely needs contact. And very young wildlife, young, very young wild raccoons will have probably not be able to survive on their own. But please bear in mind that because raccoons are rab rabies vector species, this means that they, they amongst all mammals, but raccoons especially can contract rabies. 
and we have to be extra cautious. And if rabies are prevalent in your county, they may not be able to be rehabilitated. The rehabilitator you contact will know this information. So still call and find out all the details because in the end, at least you still may be able to help. It's just a matter of how much help you can be. And perhaps that's removing these young wild animals off the landscape to help find a more suitable solution so they're not wandering out in traffic by themselves or not being able to be cared for by the adult who's no longer present. It's not at all uncommon to find a young a youngster raccoon maybe sleeping on a front porch or having snuck into an enclosed seasonal patio or something along those lines because again it goes back to what i've said a few times they're looking for places where they feel safe so they're weighing their options even though it's the area smells like humans and they can hear a dog barking from inside the home if they find a place where a lot of other wild animals won't go including predators they may sleep there and that might include a front porch. They feel like they're safer from other adult raccoons who might try to kick their tails and beat them up. They may feel safer sitting on that front porch. And in that case, the best thing you can do if you don't want that animal there is just to scare it away. Clap your hands, maybe you grab a broom and brush and swing the broom around to scare it off the porch. It will run away. And you're doing that animal a favor by creating that boundary, reminding that animal not to be used to humans, to become habituated and fearless because a wild animal is not naturally fearless of humans, of course. So we, you want to instill that natural fear that they should have. In the case of encountering a raccoon or, or any mammal for that matter that is walking in circles, falling down in a, a, what appears to be maybe seizures, it's drooling, its eyes are crusty. This is a sick animal that clearly needs attention. So contact your lo local law enforcement agency or a wildlife officer, call the Division of Wildlife or a re wildlife rehabilitator to find out what your options are. But this is clearly an animal that is sick and needs attention. Opossums are very common on the landscape, as you know, and they get themselves into predicaments because they embrace a lot of opportunities, much like raccoons, to live in our environment. They're very tolerant of many things that they encounter when living in urban and suburban areas, and they are not too proud to raid garbage cans and seek good opportunities to, to feed their bellies. So, uh, just like the, the previous slide where the raccoon is in the garbage can, opossums will find themselves in such predicaments as, as stuck in garbage cans or dumpsters. So just turn that garbage can on its side and allow the animal to scurry out and on its way. If it's a dumpster, or just a, a long board that's set inside the dumpster at a 45 degree angle will allow that animal to crawl up that board and and hop to the ground and and or crawl to the ground and wander off but again it's not going to do it if you just hover over it if you're just standing there trying to call it out try to encourage it out that doesn't work not like it does with a, a domesticated animal it you just have to walk away and allow it to come out when it feels comfortable and and maybe that's not till dusk in the broad daylight it may not feel comfortable leaving a dumpster or a garbage can but you can encourage it by by smacking the bottom of the garbage can or the dumpster but it may just huddle down in that case so this goes back to our message that I keep repeating and that's to just give it its space if you see a young opossum walking by itself it's very small it's fully furred it may be on the cusp of preparing to venture out on its own, but it may have gotten left behind too. This is a picture of a very common scenario of what a female entails after she is reproduced in the spring. She will carry her young around on her back and that's not a lot of space. They're clinging on, those little babies are clinging on with their toes and holding on to her fur and just they're hitching a ride and sometimes they will tumble off and she may not notice and they do get left behind, but they're resilient creatures. So, the, and very opportunistic, like they said, they eat everything from berries to insects to forbs and grasses. They eat all sorts of stuff. So they, it may be able to survive on its own, but this is a place, a situation where it's best to seek advice from a professional. And if you see an animal, an opossum that's missing the tips of its ears, 
and missing toes and its face is all beat up and scratched, but it's not bleeding. It's just really scarred and pretty rough looking. That's quite common. Even though opossums don't live in the environment very long, a, a an opossum that's three or four years old is actually a quite old opossum because they are mostly a prey species. But they are very tough creatures. They just they encounter a lot over their short lifespans. So they're getting fights with other opossums. They're getting preyed upon by other creatures, by predators, but they're able to evade. Plus, they're not very well furred. If you look at that face, the fur isn't very heavy. There's no fur on around the nose or on the ears. Um, you can see the little the tails of the babies. They have no fur on their tails. And opossums will will become active even in really cold temperatures. So early in the spring, for instance, or even late into the fall when the temperatures are, are low, opossums might still be active and they do get frostbite. And yet it doesn't seem to slow them down. So to see an opossum that looks pretty beat up is not that unusual and doesn't need help. But if you see things like we talked about in the beginning, open wounds, bleeding, broken limbs, obviously that's a situation where you should contact a wildlife professional. Let's talk about white-tailed deer. This is definitely the most common call that we get from concerned citizens, deer fawns that seem to be orphaned or abandoned. And this is absolutely, I shouldn't say absolutely, but in my experience, nine out of 10 times, the female, the doe, the mom, she has left and gone off to forage in, away from her baby and the baby is left alone on purpose. And this might be in a flower bed in the front yard of a home, just like you see in this picture. This is just down the street from my house. This is my neighbor's place. We were walking the dogs one morning, just off for a nice morning stroll when I look over in the yard and there is a baby deer laying very still, flat as a pancake at the base of a big oak tree. So all I did was knock on my neighbor's door to let her know that you have a fawn bedded down in your front yard. And her first question was, is it okay? Is it hurt? And I assured her there was nothing to indicate the fawn was injured. This is really common. So she decided to keep her dog inside that day to let it out the back door on a leash to make sure there were no negative encounters. And I gave her my phone number to make sure that if the fawn continued to stay there for a long period of time, she could call me. But as we expected, at dusk, mom came back, retrieved her baby, and they wandered off. Sometimes the doe will come back at dusk or dawn, feed the baby and leave her young there and wander off again. It just depends on the circumstances, especially if it's a really young fawn. That very newborn fawn that may only be a few days old doesn't have a lot of sustained energy. It can't walk around with, with the mom for very long periods of time. It wears out. It can't evade predators because it's not quite strong enough yet. And that's why the doe will leave her young still for long periods of time. They rest, they're growing, and then she'll come back and feed them every so many hours. So again, just like I've mentioned of the other species, the doe will probably not return to tend to her fawn if there's humans standing around watching or she might feel like she needs to protect her fawn. And each spring we do get a few reports of does that have acted assertively or aggressively because they felt like their baby was being threatened. So absolutely just keep your distance away from the fawn, keep pets at bay, remind children to be respectful and to enjoy wildlife from a distance. Don't handle the fawn, don't feed the fawn. These are all ways that we can make sure to keep wildlife wild because good intentions can hurt. And we just, we need to let wildlife do its thing because wild animals know how to survive and, and to care for their young better than we certainly do. And the front yard, you're looking at this picture, probably thinking, well, that just doesn't look safe at all. There's not that much protective cover. There's not much protective cover in the flower bed where I found my fawn once. But to these does, they, they know what they think is best for their young. So just try to leave these animals alone. However, if there is something amiss, like this fawn 
stands up and starts bleating, which is vocalizing and, and crying for long periods of time, clearly the doe isn't returning. Is it because there's humans outside not allowing that doe to safely return? Or has it been quiet and that doe still hasn't come back? Then a professional does need to be contacted. If a fawn is collected and brought inside, and especially over the course of a few days, this fawn can no longer be reunited with the mother safely because at this point it's become habituated to humans and who knows what it has eaten in that time. It may, may not even be healthy because white-tailed deer fawns cannot digest most human foods, cow's milk, for instance, or even goat's milk is not good for their bellies. And in this case, this deer might be sick. So please don't take the fawn inside and try to care for it. Call a professional. There's a video here that I don't think, oh, there it goes. Is it playing, Logan? Yes. Excellent. So this is a video from a trail camera in the Youngstown area. And you see, this is a tiny little fawn. It's only a few days old. It's with its mother. It still clearly has its spots if you look closely. Look how slowly it's moving. Imagine if that doe continues on for hours foraging and feeding and traveling about. This fawn is going to wear out really fast. Those tiny little legs just can't keep up. So this is a really good reason why the doe doesn't travel great distances in its first, the, the baby's first few weeks of life um, because it, the, the baby just can't keep up. So once the, the fawn does grow big enough, then it will start following mom around a whole lot more. And that's when you'll probably witness more activity of fawns or it's not uncommon to see two or three fawns with a doe being more active during the daytime and nighttime hours. If you encounter a deer that definitely has something weird going on, please contact a professional and we can assist. Maybe we can't exactly help that deer, but we can take steps to make sure that it's no longer in distress. In the top left picture, you see the deer that has growths all over it. This is a common, very natural occurrence. And these are fibromas. This is um, an infection of the skin. And some deer will have just a few bumps and it will never create a problem for that deer its entire life. And for whatever reason, some other individuals will grow many, many fibromas that will ultimately consume its body. And it will just grow, they will grow all over. And if they get broken open, they can get infected. And we do get quite a few calls every year because we have a lot of deer on the landscape of deer that have these skin conditions. So we will weigh the options and, and try to decide on a case by case basis if we should help that animal or if we can help that animal. So please contact us. In this case, you can see the deer's eyes are affected by these fibromas. It probably feels pretty rough. It's having a hard time feeding. And in that case, we may be able to take steps that it no longer has to suffer. And the picture of the deer with the plastic pumpkin on its head, this is called a button buck. And if you look closely at the top of this deer's head, you can see the two little button antlers and the strap got caught on the buttons. And so this, it probably stuck its nose in to inspect some candy that might've been left inside or it just smelled good. And maybe it had some water that had, it had caught some from some rainwater and it's getting a drink, but the strap just got stuck on those buttons. And in most cases, this bucket can't just fall off because it's the, the strap is stuck. So we sometimes have to intervene because this deer can't feed, it can't get water because its face is completely enclosed. But in the bottom picture, this is a soccer net or a hammock, I think it's a hammock. So this this buck white-tailed deer was walking through a yard. It got stuck in the hammock, ripped the hammock down and wandered off. This is not a situation where we're gonna put the deer through more stress trying to remove that hammock because this is late summer, early fall when this happened. And as you might know, deer shed their antlers 
every winter. And in this case, once the antlers are shed, the hammock will fall off too. This deer can still see, it can still get water, it can still feed. So it's not uh, suffering at all. And in this case, we're not gonna put it through more stress in order to try to fix a situation that does not need, need repaired. Moving on to bats. This time of year, bats are starting to reproduce. They're looking for places to raise their young, sometimes with species such as big brown bats. That includes human dwellings. You might hear more noise, some scratching um, and, and sounds that you don't recognize coming from an attic, and that's because it sounds like you might have bats. So as preventative, or as I've said with other species, it's of utmost importance to do routine checks of your home to look for cracks and crevices. It's amazing the tiny little spaces that bats can fit into that you would never think that they could fit through. If they can get their faces through their tiny little heads, they can get the rest of their bodies. So it's important to right now look for places where you think wildlife might want to be to find places to live and to reproduce and close the, up those places. If it's too late, those bats are already in your attic, you need to seek professional advice because at this point, baby bats, once they're born, they can't fly for an extended period of time. So if you wait for the adults to leave, say at dusk, when they go out to feed, when the weather warms, if you close off that area, the baby bats are still inside. So you have to keep that in mind and then the, the adults cannot reunite with their young. So the best time, if you already have bats in your house and they've already reproduced and it's say it's May, at this point, the ideal set of circumstances is to allow those bats to, to grow, to fly away and then close off those spaces in your home or your garage or your shed, wherever they have taken up residence. So around August or September, by then all babies have flown the coop, so to speak, and then that's time to, to make repairs. Rabies are a concern. If you find a bat in your home and that, that bat has come in contact with a human being and has broken skin, it has bitten because maybe someone handled that bat trying to put it outside, contact the health department. Just to be safe, rabies are not as prevalent in bats as one might believe. All, all mammals, all warm-blooded creatures can carry rabies, but there is definitely a misconception in the world that the bats, all bats carry rabies, which is not true, but we don't see bats that often. So it is unusual to encounter a bat. Like you see the, the images on this slide of a bat hanging on a, a, the side of a building, a brick building, or this bat laying on the windshield wipers of a vehicle. This is, these pictures were taken at the same location. And what had happened is that the, the space where they were living was closed off abruptly. And when they returned in the morning, they found that they couldn't get back inside. They hung around a little bit and then they ultimately looked, explored elsewhere for other, another more suitable place to live. But if these bats hadn't left and they looked unhealthy and they were sick, then they would absolutely need to be taken to a professional. And it's of utmost importance that we protect wildlife as best we can, but especially with bats. If you're not familiar with white nose syndrome, contact me afterwards. I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. It's been devastating to bat populations. This is not a condition that affects humans. However, it does very seriously affect bat populations and they are having a very hard time right now. So please use the, the wisest judgment you can in protecting our bat populations. This goes for box turtles too. They're such cute, charismatic creatures. They don't bite, they don't scratch typically. And it seems fun for people to collect them and take them home as pets, but that has led to a detrimental effect to box turtle populations in Ohio and elsewhere. So please do not take turtles home as pets. If you see a turtle crossing the road and it's safe for you to do so, please scoop it up and, and help it move further across the road to get it out of harm's way in the direction it was traveling. But please don't take it home. Many research projects have recently proven that box turtles that are moved 
out of their territories. They have very small territories and placed in a foreign territory miles away don't survive very well, if at all, because they're in a foreign territory and they're trying to return home. So they're going to try to get back to where they were. So please, if you see no injuries, the turtle otherwise looks perfectly healthy. Again, move it out of harm's way. If it's crossing the road, put it in, the sa in a safe spot on the other side of the road and let it be on its way. We get calls about nesting turtles and snapping turtles are really common, even if you're not that close to water. Females will travel sometimes over a mile away to create a nest. And if she finds suitable soil, she's going to lay her eggs there, even if it doesn't seem like the right spot. So if you can tolerate having the nest there and keep pets away, then please consider doing so. It takes them about um, three months to hatch if in fact they hatch that same year. I've heard that sometimes they may not even hatch to the late, the next spring if they're laid very, very late. Um, so just try to take some precautions like keeping pets away and avoiding using lawn chemicals that might harm the eggs or harm the young. And eventually they will make their way to water. They know where to go. Mom won't hang around. So once she lays the egg, she'll cover them back up and leave. And it's not uncommon for a turtle egg net for turtle nests to be raided, oftentimes by raccoons or foxes. So that is those eggs provide a lot of sustenance to a lot of other creatures on the landscape. So don't uh, don't get too upset if a nest turtle nest has been raided by a predator that helps predators feed their babies, too. But you can take some steps to ensure that they are as successful as possible by uh, by doing things like avoiding the chemicals and not allowing domestic dogs, for instance, to dig up their nests. So flag that nest spot so you remember not to, to do any digging around there, for instance, and then hopefully these babies will hatch and be on their merry way. I keep talking about wildlife rehabilitators. Who are these people? This is a wonderful group of trained professionals that, who are certified by the state of Ohio to properly care for wildlife. They're all very different people who work out of the goodness of their hearts, many out of their homes to do this. They're not employees of Division of Wildlife, of a government entity. They're often individuals who just really care deeply about the welfare of wildlife and try to help orphaned, injured, and distressed wildlife. So you can find out more about the Ohio Wildlife Rehabilitators Association and find out what where there are wildlife rehabilitators near you at owra.org. We have over 80 wildlife rehabilitators in the state of Ohio. Some are more concentrated in the state than others. We have quite a few here in Northeast Ohio where, where I live, but some counties don't have any. So please bear in mind that if you do reach out to wildlife rehabilitator, you might have to drive a little ways or find someone who can deliver that animal a little ways away in order to get it, it, the help that it needs. Maybe all you need is advice over the phone, which a wildlife rehabilitator can do that, but also we can do that at Division of Wildlife, reach out to us. I have contact information at the end, but I know I've said it a few times, but please bear in mind that it's always best to call for advice first, and we can help guide you to the right decision to make that, that call that's best for everybody. Some things to, to keep in mind to avoid, uh, best avoid orphaned and injured wildlife if we can, is to trim trees and shrubs in the colder months when wildlife is not actively reproducing and nesting. Alter windows, we talked a little bit about that. I won't go deeply into it, but I'd be glad to if you contact me afterwards. To, we want to prevent window strikes, remove that reflection so that birds don't collide with windows. Keep our domestic pets at bay. Keep Try to be as responsible pet owner, especially in the spring and summer months, as you possibly can be. Always check an area. If you're preparing to remodel, you have to take a tree down because it's a safety hazard and it's the, the middle of spring or summer. Just check first as best you can to make sure that there's not an active nest of young before you take steps. And if in fact there is, seek professional advice on how best to handle that situation. Watch from a distance, give wild animals their space always. They're best raised by their wildlife parents. 
We have some information at wildohio.gov. If you can take a look at these posters, print them out or contact us for copies, then we can um, help you deliver the message. Maybe you can take these posters or our brochures. We have brochures available too. Call us at 1-800-WILDLIFE to order copies. Take them to your, your local veterinarian veterinarian and drop them off in the office. Um, for instance, if you have any use for these posters, please help spread the message and help people understand how best to help wildlife, which is to let wildlife stay wild. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate you tuning in. Reach out to me. My email address is on this slide at jamie.emmert at ohio.gov or reach out to us at wildohio.gov. Follow us online and we'll do our best to help you out. Have a great day. Great job, Jamie. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.